We went to Peru to document the seemingly crazy sophistication and precision of the megalithic stones, and also to investigate if there was any evidence that they were softening stones. But beyond that, we had a super fun list of things we wanted to document, some of which were in Bolivia and Chile, like these uh, horsetails, which are only eight or nine feet here, but in Chile, they still grow 20 to 24 feet, but were 150 feet in the fossil record. COVID restrictions kept us out of Bolivia and Chile, and after crashing my drone and almost getting run over by a train, I had to pivot and find things that didn't need droning. So I looked at my list again, figured out what I could do, and off I went to a mysterious region called Talara, Peru. Quite a distance from where I was in the Sacred Valley, and now that I was on my own with John having gone home, I was feeling a little bit harebrained for having traveled so far north to a place that I don't even know and only given myself 24 hours to find the largest low sequence and dish structures supposedly in the world, which I found even though I only had the name of the town, and I'll show you in a second. But if I had known that region was so geologically fascinating, I would have given myself more time because little did I know that the equivalent of the La Brea tar pits was there and they found giant sloths, armadillos, jaguars, and over 80 species of birds. It's just a really fascinating area. First, I went to the petrified forest, which was apparently difficult even to find for a local. But when we finally found where it was, which is way back in on somebody's property, the first thing that caught my attention was these roundish pillowy looking things that they weren't pillow lava because they were sandstone, but I'm really curious as to what they are. So if you know, can you put it in the comments? The second thing that I found was petrified bark absolutely everywhere. There was different colors of lava lying around and there was also bark that was fossilized and embedded right in the sandstone. But the coolest thing I found there was the petrified tree that was probably a good 30 or 40 feet long, at least what I could see of it. There's perhaps more that was buried. After the petrified forest, we went to Lobitos where I found a hostel and started asking around to find out where those caves were for the low sequence tomorrow. In the meantime, this was a really cool place to stay. But again, my love of geology trumped even the cool animals and stuff I saw there. There were these cool concretions sticking out of the sides of the cliffs everywhere and they were such beautiful shapes. And in certain places you could actually see inside them. There wasn't anything special, just a little bit denser material, but it was really cool to see all these things and there was just tons of them. The other cool thing you'll notice is that there's tar everywhere. I mean, literally right on the beach, which shouldn't be, surprise me because once it became nightfall, you could see all the oil drilling rigs set up in the bay. There was tons of them. Some of them didn't have lights, but there was probably a good 10 of them out there. And everywhere you drove along, you would see you know, drilling rigs because the whole area is just full of oil. The next morning we hit the jackpot. My guide took me through the stone forest, as it's called, and down this cliff face <laughs> to where we found just miles of the most gorgeous layers and cross bedding, low sequences, all kinds of absolutely cool things. To get there, we went through this cave, but the coolest thing in there was these giant pieces of tar. I mean, just huge boulder sized things. And then of course, these little guys that apparently thought that they owned the beach. But coming out and looking around, the first thing that strikes you is the idea that you feel like you're on Mars. Then when you start looking more closely, you see all these cool evidences that this was laid down underwater with a lot of sediment all at once. And then beyond that, you're seeing layers that before they were completely hardened, other layers came ripping through, tearing this stuff out and putting more cross beds down. So you're just seeing devastation on top of devastation. My question as a young earth creationist is what kind of forces could possibly be going on to create the sheer volume of trauma in those layers, if not the worldwide flood? What really caught my attention were these beautiful diagonal lines. They weren't cracks, they were plump, as if they were filled with something, and many of them were curved and twisted. I've ran it by a couple of geologists and they're telling me it's conjugate joint sets. He said in this case, some of them were sediment structures called sandstone dikes, and that basically when there's a fracture and then there's overpressure of water that's pushing down on the sediment, Anything in the lower layer is just gonna come up and out. So it's basically a fluid escape structure. So all this beautiful stuff is basically what you'd expect to see in a worldwide flood. 
One of them even said deposition rates may have been feet per minute. Whatever worldview you come from, though, I hope you continue to enjoy the adventures we go on with the Lost World Museum. <laughs>